This is hell. Prostitutes are fighting for their rights, and they've been fighting for their rights a lot longer than you think. The problem is, too often, people working as prostitutes are rarely asked their opinion on sex work, leading to it being criminalized and sex workers in contact with their greatest security risk, the police. Here to help us understand the sex worker rights movement and why their fight for safety and improved economic conditions is so important for all civil rights movements. Molly Smith is co-author with Juno Mack of Revolting Prostitutes, The Fight for Sex Workers' Rights. Welcome to This Is Hell, Molly. Hi. Hi, Chuck. Thanks for having me on. Molly is a sex worker and activist with the Sex Worker Advocacy and Resistance Movement. You can find out more about SWARM, which is what the movement is known as, by visiting swarmcollective.org. She's also involved with Scott Pep, a sex worker-led charity based in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, which is Working to decriminalize sex work in Scotland. You can find out more about Scott Pep by visiting scot uk, And you can follow Molly on Twitter at Pasta Chips, where she describes herself as a tired prostitute, communist, and feminist. I love that <laughs> description. That is really fantastic. So let me just start with Thank this you. because I'm never certain, because I've talked with a lot of sex workers on our show. What is the better term to use, prostitution or sex work? Does it make any difference? Oh, uh, good question. Um, it's complicated. I think, um, in general, people prefer sex work because it um, speaks to sex work as work, and it's obviously like you know a strong political statement and choice to like uh, situate uh, prostitution as labour in that way. Um, that being said, obviously, when Juno and I uh, decided to name our book Revolting Prostitutes, we were very much kind of looking to reclaim um, the term prostitute, which we both um, have had a bit of a journey with over the years. We were initially um, really hating it and feeling like it was always an insult. And uh, as we've kind of grown, um, we've both come to quite enjoy it and to feel that it um that it actually has a kind of value of its own um so yeah it's complicated <laughs> <laughs> you start the book uh with a quote from author and new yorker staff writer ariel levy uh saying the women who are really being emulated and obsessed over in our culture now strippers porn stars pinups aren't even people they are merely sexual uh, persona erotic dollies from the land of make-believe and their performance and performances which is the only capacity in which we uh, see these women we so fetishize they don't even speak as far as we know they have no ideas no feelings no political beliefs no relationships no past no future no humanity it, uh-huh. it, why do we view the women we emulate and obsess over as without humanity. What does that say about us? Is that that contradictory that we obsess and emulate them, but we view them without humanity? Or is that just uh, consistent within misogyny? Mm, Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, I feel like that's, it's partly misogyny, right? And also I think Ariel Levy's book uh, was more talking, to be fair to her, about kind of um, women who are like quite famous that like glamour models and porn actresses etc um but when we were uh reading around for, but obviously she's talking about sex workers as glamour models and porn actresses are um and when we were reading around for the book we were just so struck by the you know the stuff where she's like no no past no no politics no um you know no life of their own or whatever um yeah just because, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it really epitomizes how, I guess, um, anti prostitution feminist writers uh, can sort of think that what they're doing is describing patriarchy, but actually what they're doing is also perpetuating it, you know, because she's also saying, like, it's easy to read that as her kind of saying those things about women who sell sex or who sell sexuality in some way in public. Um, yeah. Well, why do you think it is? The, what explains why we don't give voice to sex workers, even when the subject is sex work? It doesn't really seem to make sense. It's like talking to 
you know, uh, Klansmen about uh, rights for African Americans. It doesn't really make sense to you. What explains why why we don't give voice to sex workers, even when that's the subject? Right. I mean, I guess like you know, being someone who's known to sell sex is very you know discrediting because, um, and it's sort of it's sort of um, hard to tell which comes first: the stigma against prostitutes uh, versus the sense that prostitutes are drawn from populations um, who our society already, you know, stigmatizes and discredits. So, you know, women, LGBTQ people, people of color, drug users, undocumented migrants, you know, sex workers are disproportionately drawn from all these groups. And of course, people with multiple uh, identities uh, that overlap within those groups. Um, and and then and then sex work in itself becomes another reason to dismiss uh, to dismiss them. Um, so yeah, it's kind of this like vicious circle. It's a really vicious circle. Um, so uh, is the sex is the reason that the sex workers movement uh, that it's not already included within other radical social justice movements? Is it is it simply? that this is seen as a practical, pragmatic, political move by human rights groups so as not to associate with sex workers but because it could be unpopular. And if that is the case, what does that say about the human rights movement, about the social justice movement today, if they're making practical, pragmatic decisions not to include sex workers within their fight for rights? Yeah, I think it is partly that. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, um, a city in Scotland was running uh, an event for um, World HIV Day, World AIDS Day, and they invited Scott Pep, one of the sex work organisations that I'm involved with, um, to like potentially come along and maybe maybe have the opportunity to speak. Um, but they also like very. Um, uh, very kind of contradictorily, were very anxious that we like to know exactly how we were going to talk about sex work and were we going to talk about sex work and were we going to be seen as promoting sex work and all this kind of stuff. And it was just like so, so bizarre that the HIV movement, which, um, you know, is is so linked in many ways to the struggles of prostitutes' rights, was, was, has become like, was, was so gentrified in this Scottish city that like, and so kind of managerial and kind of NGO, NGO-ified that the idea of like, they, they sort of felt they had to invite prostitutes, but they also felt incredibly anxious about it. And like, really were like, you can't talk about sex work. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think in terms of like the wider left, um, uh, the issue of prostitution, um, kind of understandably raises really strong feelings. Um, you know, as we write in the book, really kind of sex is complicated and work is bad. And um, people often kind of, it's like it's like where they would be critical of cops on other issues. People often think, oh my God, prostitution is so bad. It's so horrible. Um, you know, more policing must fix this. Um and like even you get that even in quite like left wing radical spaces. So kind of a big um, a big struggle for sex workers uh, on the left is to try and get other um, kind of leftist organisers to understand that when we're saying you know the police harm us and what we need are you know rights and justice that isn't dependent on policing. Um, that we're not making kind of somehow kind of quite like neoliberal demands. So like sex workers are often caricatured as like somehow being supportive of the market or supportive of capitalism when we're saying we want workers' rights, we want economic justice, we want gender justice. Yeah, the, your book is fascinating. You, you write, many people want to stop us from selling sex or fix the world so we don't need to or just ensure they don't have to look at us. But we are notoriously hard to get rid of at least through criminal law. Can the world be, quote-unquote, fixed so sex work is no longer in demand? And, and, and how much does the belief that the world can be fixed so we don't need sex work lead to the criminalization of sex work, whether the believer supports cr- criminalization of sex work or not? Yeah, I mean, I think Gino and I both do think that the world can be fixed. Um, so that people largely don't have to sell sex anymore. Um, it's just that there is this kind of tendency um, to kind of like, yeah, to short circuit it or to, to reach for what feels like the easy option, which is policing. Um, but I think, you know, 
um, in the book, one of the things we come back to again and again is the idea that, like, if you know, people sell sex to get the resources they need. If everybody had the resources they need, you know, a, a stable income, safe, secure housing, um, health care, you know, the right to work and have workers' rights and safety, uh, regardless of your immigration status, um, you know, access to the to the drugs that you potentially need, um, you know, if everyone had all those things. Um, then they wouldn't have to sell sex in order to in order to get them. Um, so, you know, in a sense, we both think that the sex industry actually can largely be abolished. We just don't think that they, that can be done by funding police departments uh, or funding um, border security. Um, I don't think that people realize to what degree... Uh, sex workers are policed. You ask, what are the consequences of calling the police or of being visible to them as a gaggle on the street? Uh, what does it mean for a sex worker when their client or manager is afraid of the police? Who is it, uh, who is at risk of deportation and homelessness and why when it comes to policing of sex workers? So how much are sex workers police? Arrest or prostitution are rarely in the news, and there are those who have the impression that it is you know, as police is something as minimal as uh, minimally criminal, like uh, smoking a joint in public, and that you just get a ticket and a fine, and you're told to, you know, be on your way, and that's it. So, how aggressively is prostitution police as a, uh, policed as a sex worker who has witnessed this? Right. So that was one, definitely one of the things we really, you know, wanted to kind of use this space that we had in the book to talk about in a really granular way. Because obviously, you know, we talk about a load of different jurisdictions. So like in the US, for example, prostitution is much more aggressively policed than uh, in the UK um, and, you know, policed in different ways. You know, the policing of sex work manifests differently in Amsterdam, uh, you know, in Cape Town, in Moscow. Um and we wanted to have an opportunity to talk about all those different kinds of things. Um, I think obviously the first thing to say is that like the policing of sex work is uh, hugely dependent on who you are and particularly dependent on race. So white sex workers are not policed in any way the same extent as sex workers of colour or black sex workers. And that's the case regardless of jurisdiction all over the world. The policing of prostitution is used um, you know, as a tool of racism, as a tool of racist policing. Um, and again, like lots of different other kinds of factors make some sex workers much more vulnerable um, to really catastrophic policing. So uh, undocumented migration status, um, uh, being a mother means that you can potentially like, lose your children, um, all these kinds of things. Um, but also, yeah, I think I think one of the other things that we really wanted to emphasise was um, not only, you know, what kinds of um, harms befall sex workers when we are, you know, targeted by the police or by the criminal legal system, um, but also the kinds of harms that befall sex workers uh, where, when we have to take steps to avoid that targeting. So, you know, in the UK, uh, it's legal for one sex worker to work alone in a flat. But if you work with a friend, uh, you can both be arrested and charged with brothel keeping the other. Um, so obviously that means that some people are arrested and charged with that every year, and that's disproportionately migrants, in particular the UK police, like really strongly target migrant sex workers with that law. Um, but like it's not the harms of that law aren't just the people who are arrested and charged, although obviously they suffer a horrible, horrifying brunt of it. Uh, it's also that most, like so many people have to, work alone because they fear arrest you know and working alone makes sex workers obviously really vulnerable to violent clients so we're constantly having to choose between fear of arrest versus fear of violent clients that is just stunning and i'm so glad that you wrote this book because that way i'd have a better perspective on this i'm so glad that finally somebody is allowing sex workers to give their own voice we've had like i said in the past we've had several sex workers on the show and it's always very mm -hmm. refreshing when people who are silenced by the mainstream corporate establishment media actually have access to the media you quote feminist mm -hmm. writer kate millett noting that feminist rhetoric suggests that all women are prostitutes that marriage is prostitution and you write that in 1977 the sex worker led collective pros program for reform of the law on solicitation 
soliciting, wrote that it wanted the women's liberation movement to think about the whole thing, prostitution, and discuss it, but not just use it, explaining that the women's movement has used the word prostitute in a really nasty way about housewives to some of their idea of the exploded, exploited situation of women. They noted that this interest in the metaphorical uses of prostitute, as we were talking about at the beginning of our conversation, was not accompanied by much practical support for sex workers' effects or efforts to tackle criminalization. Is prostitution then not the site of exploitation that feminists have made it out to be? Is making it a site of exploitation, in your opinion, even potentially anti-feminist? No, I mean, so prostitution absolutely is a site of exploitation and harm. Uh, You know, it's a site of patriarchal exploitation. It's a site of uh, white supremacist harm. It's a site of capitalist exploitation. Um, And we totally empathise with other feminists who, you know, kind of, in our view, correctly identify those things in the sex industry. Um, It's just that we don't think that policing uh, and the criminal legal system can make that better. In fact, we think that that makes those harms worse. Um, But yeah, I mean, to kind of slightly return to the beginning of your question in terms of like the... um, the way uh, the wider feminist movement uses uh, the term prostitute, I think there's something really key in that, in how non-prostitute women um, are very kind of invested in talking about prostitution because, you know, it's this really richly kind of symbolic terrain where our feelings about womanhood and masculinity and patriarchy and money and power, you know, all kind of coalesce in this space where you talk about the prostitutes, um, you know, and the prostitute therefore, like the prostitute woman comes to symbolize, uh, you know, the harms inflicted on all women under patriarchy. Um, and, but kind of almost paradoxically, that doesn't lead to solidarity with prostitutes. Um, it leads to uh, sex workers be, you know, it, le- it leads to other feminist women, uh, you know, arguing for various kinds of criminalization of the sex industry, um, you know, because they want to kind of push it out of sight because because what it symbolizes for them is women's subjugation. And that's that's true. Um, but policing doesn't solve that. <laughs> policing makes it worse. And you write that in the mid-19th century, as middle-class women emerge into the public sphere of the professions, a new kind of role was invented, which married the ideal values and attributes of middle-class femininity to paid employment. In part, this can be thought of as a feminist project, as the alleged moral superiority of these women justified their taking a more public role in society, including working outside the home, the legal right to own property, the vote, so on. But the creation of professionalized caring roles, such as philanthropic and social work, was about employment that reproduced rather than upset gender roles. These women were reasserting their position in a class hierarchy over working class people, particularly working class women and children, who were targeted as recipients for maternalistic and coercive forms of care. Is there a disconnect between women's rights and sex worker rights movements based on class? Do they not find common ground because middle-class feminism views sex workers as lower class and in need of care and maternalism? Um, Yes. I mean, I think there certainly is a huge conflict um, within feminism over sex worker rights. And and there has been, you know, as as we kind of detail and as the extracts we just read details, it's kind of at least what we might call the first wave of feminism, so like the kind of Victorian era. Um, mm, I think, I think you know, ob- obviously, and obviously we would argue that sex worker rights are women's rights. So like to us, there is, there is not a conflict. Um, um, and yeah, and, and to me, it feels like the sex worker rights movement is, um, you know, it's, it's obviously a kind of, is obviously part of the feminist movement. Um, so that conflict, the way in which it's so fraught, the way in which, you know, um, the relationship of sex workers to uh, the wider feminist movement is so fraught, um, is really is really kind of painful for a lot of sex workers, I think. Um, uh, yeah, and one of the things that we really found in writing the book was that it gave us the space to um, kind of try and empathise with other strands of feminism, um so yeah because ultimately we found that we did have you know we did have sympathy with kind of 
uh, where like pro criminalization feminism comes from. Like as I as I talked about earlier, you know we kind of agree that the sex industry is a site of all these different kinds of harms. Uh, it's just as I keep saying, we don't think that the police can fix that. Um, you know, and conversely, we're also quite critical of um, some kinds of liberal feminism that, in our view, also have a kind of too simplistic view on prostitution. Um, which is, you know, kind of almost too celebratory. Um, so we sort of feel like liberal feminists are correct in identifying uh, that a large part of why the prostitute woman is stigmatised is because she's having sex that is deemed, you know, non-normative. Um, and, you know, and therefore they link that uh, that kind of sex, like non-normative sex to other kinds of non-normative sex, whether that's, you know, sex that seems promiscuous or queer sex or, you know, all those other kinds of things. Um, but it's not enough to simply kind of celebrate prostitution in the ways that we might celebrate quote unquote promiscuity or or queer sex between women, um, because unlike those other two things, uh, prostitution is a really direct economic relation. And that's why we need a kind of anti-capitalist analysis uh, rather than just saying sex is good, because actually sex is complicated and work is bad and cops are bad. <laughs> right. And let's get to the cops are bad thing just for a second here, because uh, mm-hmm. you write that laws are not just messaging. They are what the police are permitted to do in the world. What are police permitted to do to sex workers that non-sex workers may not know? What does the law allow cops to do to prostitutes that may surprise those who are not sex workers? Right. OK, good question. And I mean, that sort of comes back to uh, what we're talking about in terms of um the way in which non-prostitute women um, use the idea of the prostitute as this kind of wider symbol or like metaphor for women's experiences under patriarchy. And then what's so fascinating about that is that when sex workers interject to not only say that policing is harmful, but to talk specifically about what kinds of harms policing brings to our lives, we're seen as like presenting this kind of weird obsession with detail, you know, that it's almost like irrelevant. It's like, why are you bringing this niche niche issue to, you know, to this great wider discussion about like abstraction? Um, So, I mean, I think, you know, I think the, just the reality of, of police, of the policing of sex work is so invisible in so many ways. So again, like, you know, the fear that I talked about earlier in terms of, um, you know, two women in the UK sharing a flat, uh, risk arrest for brothel keeping. And as we write in the book, um, both me and Juno have experienced clients, probably clients calling up and saying, are you working alone today? And having to juggle in that moment between the fear that this is a perpetrator who's hoping you're going to say, you know, yes, I am working alone so that he can come and rob you or or attack you um, versus the fear that this is a police officer looking to make an easy arrest that day, uh, you know, looking for you to say, actually, I'm working with a friend. And then, you know, the police officer can turn up and arrest you both. Um, yeah. But I mean, also, I think like it's really important, again, to talk about the way in which immigration law uh, intersects with with prostitution law. So in the UK, um, it's really a kind of complicated legal grey area, even for EU citizens who obviously at present have the legal right to live and work in the UK without um, without any kind of difficulty about their papers. Uh, and it's pretty common, like even even though EU citizens do have that right, I think there's um there's some I can't remember the acronym now, but there's something where you have to demonstrate that you're in education or employment. And obviously, because sex work is cash in hand, you largely can't demonstrate that you're employment in employment. And the police know that perfectly well. And as a result, they target uh, EU migrant sex workers, so like Romanian women, Polish women. Um, and they issue them with deportation notices. Uh, they will often um, confiscate passports and they will only give the passport back when someone comes down to the police station uh, with the one way ticket, um, you know, back to their country of origin. Uh, you know, they, they will really aggressively use immigration law against migrants, um, you know, because they're prostitutes. So it, it, is the problem then with sex work the police? Can uh, 
police reform lead to safety and improved economic conditions for sex workers, or does sex work have to be decriminalized, even legalized, in order for there to be better safety conditions for sex workers? So the police are certainly a key problem in terms of safety for sex workers. Um, And also, of course, capitalism uh, is another huge problem. Um, And and borders are another huge problem. So, like, I think um, when it comes to prostitution law, there is a real tendency to get fixated on the idea of the kind of silver bullet that will, uh, that will, you know, cure everything. And um, kind of feminists who support a law called the Nordic Model that um, me and you know and all other sex worker rights activists are really critical of because it harms people who sell sex. You know, I think one of the things that they're doing is they are... Um, like fixating on this idea of, of one kind of legal model as like a legal fix, when actually what Juno and I wanted to do in Revolting Prostitutes is to say that, yes, of course, you know, the legal system uh, and therefore what the police are permitted to do to prostitutes is a huge problem, and that's why sex workers absolutely need decriminalisation. But decriminalisation has to only be, it can only be seen as part of a wider puzzle that has to include uh, you know, resistance to capitalism, resistance to borders, resistance to white supremacy, um, you know, changes to drug law. Um, yeah, all these all these different kinds of things because sex workers, um, you know, face so many different kinds of struggles. You write anti-prostitution feminist Catherine McKinnon even writes with ambivalent approval of a brief jail time for prostitutes on the basis that jail can be a respite from the pimps and the street. She quotes like-minded feminists who argue that jail is the closest thing many women in prostitution have to a battered women's shelter, and that considering the absence of any other refuge or shelter, jail provides a temporary safe haven. How safe are sex workers in jail? Are they more safe in jails than on the streets? No, of course not. I mean, no one is safer in jail than on the street. Like, this is obviously an absurdity. Um, You know, jail is in itself a form of violence. There are so many other kinds of violence that are inflicted on people who are incarcerated. Um, You know, thinking of the US, uh, there's been um, kind of multiple sex workers who uh, have died in the prison system. I'm thinking of Marsha Powell, who was left out um, in the Arizona sun and died without any water for many hours and died of third-degree burns uh, as a result of that. I'm thinking of um, a woman called April Brogan, who was allowed to um, uh, uh, go into withdrawal in a Florida jail and died as a result of that. You know, and those are just kind of the first two names that spring to mind. Again, like so many sex workers in the U.S., are um, criminalised and incarcerated for self-defence. So I'm thinking of Alicia Walker, um, uh, who comrades in Chicago are kind of organising around supporting her and trying to get her out. She uh, uh, killed a client in self-defence. Her and a a friend, a colleague who were working together, were both attacked by this man. And to save both their lives, she had to kill him. And for that, she has been incarcerated uh, and is facing, you know, a multi-decade long jail term. Um, you know, that's like stories like that are so, so common. Obviously, um, Sintoya Brown uh, was just granted clemency, um, but it's absolutely routine for sex workers all over the US um, and, of course, other women as well to be criminalised and incarcerated for self-defence. Um, you know, the the prison industrial system is just this huge industrialization of gender-based violence, of violence against people of, people of color, of violence against poor people. Um, it can't be made safe. It has to be abolished. You write contemporary feminist disapproval of prostitution remains unmoored from pragmatism. More political energy goes to obstructing sex work than to what is really needed such as helping sex workers avoid prosecution or ensuring viable alternative livelihoods that are more than respectable drudgery. Is sex work better than respectable drudgery? Often, yes. 
So <laughs> we further on in the book, in the work chapter, we quote quite a few sex workers. Um, and one, th- one of the things I really like about that section of that chapter, in fact, is the way in which other people's voices really come through very strongly. So um, there's a woman we quote uh, who's based in Cape Town where she says something like, um, you know, I got so sick of cleaning other people's um bloody houses you know you know for pittance and I just couldn't do it anymore and that's my turn to sex work um or I think we also quote a sex worker from the 1920s arrested in the UK um who who kind of sarcastically demanded the police officers arresting her discuss with her like you know the contrasting amount she could earn working in a you know in a laundry or as a maid servant versus working as a sex worker um and it's really striking as well that, uh, I guess, for anti-prostitution feminists, um, partly because they're not thinking about prostitution as a response to material needs. Um, so they're thinking of it as this kind of, uh, only this kind of abject horror. And so for them, almost anything is better, right? So like, they're not thinking um about you know women who are single mothers who have to find work that's relatively well paid that fits around their child care um you know they're not thinking about people who maybe are you know disabled and who like struggle to work a kind of quote unquote normal work week um and really often the uh alternatives to prostitution that are offered to sex workers are just so so economically inadequate um you know it's pretty common for people to just kind of be derisively told like oh just go into the benefit system as if the benefit system in the uk isn't you know incredibly punitive incredibly abusive um you know incredibly hard to access uh you know loads of people get into sex work fleeing from the benefit system uh not the other way around um And I think if people thought harder about the fact that sex work is about material needs, um, then that would lead to responses which were, you know, took a more holistic uh, approach to people's material needs um, and weren't so kind of derisory and uh, dismissive of the kinds of problems that sex workers have in our lives that lead us into prostitution. Sure, material needs, economic conditions, you might be able to find common ground with others on those concerns. But to what extent do you believe worker safety as the top priority for sex worker rights can create the empathy for sex workers uh, by the public that you hope your writing can promote? Uh, Can that kind of uh, uh, concern or prioritization of worker safety, especially in the light of the biggest threat being the police, can that lead to intersectionality, common ground with anti-police violence movements like the Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah, absolutely. I think, certainly I think for um, organizations um, and campaigners who are focused on things like police violence, uh, that's a really natural um, kind of space of solidarity. And I think sex workers find it very um, kind of rewarding to, to you know participate in building solidarity there. Um, I think so. I think a lot of people uh, kind of are very find it easy to empathise with the idea of workers' rights, which is great, of course. Um, especially when you explain things like how the law currently forces people to work alone or to risk arrest. You know, people find it very easy to understand that that, you know, is a contradiction, that that promotes violence against sex workers. Um, I think, you know, we're obviously kind of collectively taught that, you know, the police are, um, uh, you know, that the police are good. You know, we're, the media, for example, is constantly bombarding us with, with the idea that, you know, when the police um, harm someone, it's a quote unquote officer involved shooting or whatever, you know, but all these like obfuscations are used to hide to hide the facts of police violence, um, to hide the facts that police in our communities uh, don't tend to make us more safe and certainly don't make us more safe if we're people of colour or working class people or drug users or undocumented migrants. Um, so I think um, in some ways, uh, the kind of person on the street 
uh, hopefully finds it easy to empathise with the idea of workers' rights and workers' safety, um, and that that being a key demand of the sex worker rights movement. Um, I think depending on who the person on the street is, they might um, need a bit more time uh, to think about how the police are, you know, drivers of harm and exploitation and violence rather than the solution to it. Um, but that's okay. I feel like, uh, or, you know, um, movements like Black Lives Matter have really like hugely shifted that conversation on in really impressive ways in the last five, 10 years. Um, and that conversation feels like it's um, kind of growing and deepening all the time. What do you mean when you write sex workers are the original feminists? How are sex workers the original feminists? Um, I mean, partly, of course, that's um, us uh, being <laughs> controversial. Um, and, you know, and make, like sex workers, as I mentioned before, have such a kind of fraught place within the feminist movement that it feels really powerful to rather than kind of apologize for and explain our presence to just like bowl in and be like we're the original feminists actually um but i think uh what we're talking about when we uh write that um we're thinking about kind of early forms of worker organization um and obviously because sex workers are disproportionately women and have been kind of throughout history um, kind of workers' organisation and organisation amongst women uh, when it comes to sex workers are, are inseparable. The two things come together. Um, so we talk about sex workers in the kind of 14th and 15th century in medieval Europe, um, you know, protesting against against brothel closures. We talk about um, sex workers in Ireland in the 16th century. I think, uh, yeah, 16th, 18th century. Um, uh, kind of banding together to share childcare, to share incomes. Um, we talk about uh, sex workers in uh, colonial Nigeria, again, like kind of forming these financial ties to each other so that like, you know, within these communities, women would all just pitch in to look after each other. Um, because sex worker organising has never been separable from mutual aid, right? Like, um it, it obviously makes sense that you would protest uh, an attempt to worsen the conditions in your workplace together, and you would also, um, you know, share childcare or share healthcare costs um, together. And you know that means working together as a community of women. Um, so that's sort of what we're talking about when we talk about sex workers, the original feminists. And you mentioned that writer Janice Raymond stated that prostitution is rape that's paid for, while while sociologist Kathleen Berry said buying and selling sex was destructive of human life. What impact do statements and views like these have on the safety concerns and economic conditions faced every day by sex workers? So um, I guess what's particularly painful about the idea that all sex work is intrinsically rape is the way in which it makes it impossible for sex workers to name the actual sexual violence that happens to us at work. Um, you know, obviously, as a current sex worker, I know and I'm so intensely aware of the difference between a client who is respectful, who, you know, stays within my boundaries, who uh, who doesn't assault me, and a client who does. Like, that, that difference is so real to me every single day. Every single day I'm thinking about how to you know, try and ensure I get the first kind of client and not the second kind of client. Um, whereas, you know, for uh, another feminist to then say, well, all of it is rape, it's like, well, how how can sex workers talk meaningfully about the things that make us more or less safe If in that case? If all sex work is rape, then, you know, a client that rapes us is exactly the same as a client who doesn't. And how can you talk about, you know, this law uh, forces me to work alone. This law forces me to compromise my screening strategies. Um, you know, this law forces me to rush um, rush my initial interaction with a client where I might be screening him. You know, all of those things really meaningfully impact on our day-to-day -day safety. And they all are totally obscured and, like, made worthless by statements like all sex work is rape. And you write how former prostitute Andrea Dworkin's work uh, became highly influ influential in the movement and set a new tone for criticism of sex work. 
in the book, uh, or she writes, uh, the prostitute lives the literal reality of being the dirty woman. There is no metaphor. She is the woman covered in dirt, which is to say that every man who has ever been on top of her has left a piece of himself behind. She is perceived as treated as, and I want you to remember this, this is real, vaginal slime. You add her confrontational writing style and her experiences in the sex trade help to legitimize and normalize similar usage of graphic and misogynist language in feminist discussions of sex workers and their bodies. Is criticism of sex workers and sex work necessarily misogynist? And if not, what makes Dworkin's critique misogynist? Um, I mean, obviously, criticism of sex workers isn't necessarily misogynist. Um, You know, like, it's perfectly common, for example, to encounter white sex workers who are also racist. Like, naming that as such isn't misogynist. Um, equally, it's perfectly possible to sort of criticise sex work uh, without being misogynist. Um, you know, in the book, Juno and I are very critical of sex work. Um, we're certainly not pro-sex work. Um, uh, I guess the difficulty comes where, um, you know, there, there is this very, there's this very kind of graphic, very like visceral language that really focuses in on like the kind of disgusting abject body of the sex worker um and you know Dworkin in a sense uh is a bit of a complicated case because she obviously also had experiences in the sex trade so um you know uh her proponents can kind of point to that and say you know she was also drawing on her own experiences which you know to an extent is legit right fine but like as as we say like that that kind of language then kind of legitimizes, um, you know, really, really kind of vile misogynist language about sex workers, um, you know, from other feminists, either kind of repeating what men have said or kind of imagining what they think misogynist men might say about sex workers and then kind of quite gleefully saying it um, and then and then calling that feminist analysis. Um and ultimately, you know, I think you can, I think you can absolutely criticise sex work um, without, without kind of drilling down on the kind of what, what you perceive as the disgustingness of the sex that sex workers have, or you know, the disgustingness of our bodies. Um, and if you can't criticise sex work without doing that, then um, your criticisms are probably really garbage. How much, you know, there's this whole idea of rescuing women from prostitution how much does seeing sex workers as in need of being rescued how does that affect the way one views sex workers and more importantly sex workers rights because you know we have this huge thing today about uh, human and sex trafficking that seems to be a gigantic campaign campaign that i would think have some similarities with this idea of rescuing women from prostitution so is viewing sex workers as in need of being uh, rescued somehow sexist or misogynist in some way? Well, I think when people talk about rescue, you've got to ask a bit more closely what they mean, right? So, like, in general, when we talk about rescue uh, from prostitution or from, quote-unquote, sex trafficking, which is, you know, there's so much on, under that phrase. There's just this huge kind of swirling morass of different meanings. Um, but when we talk about rescue from either of those situations... of the time, what we mean is uh, arrest. (laughs) Um, So sex workers will be arrested and, you know, and that will bring all the force of the criminal legal system into their lives. Uh, So, you know, as we've discussed, you know, if someone is a drug user, they'll potentially be criminalised for that or they will be left to withdraw in jail as a result of that. You know, if someone is a mother, they will potentially lose custody of their kids. If someone is a undocumented or semi-documented migrants they will often um face deportation and again like when it comes to sex trafficking which again i'm putting quote marks around um again 99.9 percent of what we talk about uh in terms of rescue from sex trafficking means deportation it means your money will be confiscated you'll be taken to a deportation center you'll be held there for a period of weeks or months indefinitely uh and then you'll be deported um so I think if we were more precise when we talked about rescue and said, you know, it means it means arrest and that means 
potentially losing whatever civilian job you have, potentially losing custody of your kids. Um, you know, it means potentially like not be, ever being able to get a civilian job ever again because you've got this arrest record for prostitution. Um, you know, it means being deported. It means having all your money taken. Um, but we would have a more precise idea of what the problem with rescue is. So, uh, Kate Millett, you write how Kate Millett recalled a feminist conference on prostitution held in 1971 when disgruntled working women arrived to demand a seat at the table. Millett writes, the title of the day's program was inscribed on leaflets for our benefit towards the elimination of prostitution. The panel of experts included everyone but prostitutes. All hell broke loose between between the prostitute and the movement because against all likelihood, prostitutes did in fact attend the conference. What explains the presumption by non-sex workers that sex workers, against all likelihood, would actually attend a feminist conference on prostitution when, in fact, sex workers are and have been very active politically within feminism and other social movements for centuries? Yeah, I mean, I guess because, you know, the prostitute woman is kind of so rich as a symbol, um, it's almost surprising to people when we turn up and aren't actually symbols where, you know, real, flawed, living, breathing, individual human beings, um, you know, and we turn up and speak. And that is, that's really surprising to people. Um, yeah. Uh, you also write that your writing is not about empowerment. It's not salacious. Does your work receive, has it received the curiosity and discussion that sex work normally receives in popular culture journalism and policy or is it more ignored than say a book that would be confessions of a sex worker oh yeah it's been much more ignored than that (laughs) um which is i mean fine the reaction that we've had has been amazing um you know uh yeah we're really really grateful to all the many people who have read it and who have told us um you know what they think about the book um but yeah it absolutely is striking that um like lots of people uh who i think and hope we discussed with um some kind of generosity and nuance in the book even though ultimately we obviously strongly disagree with them um have not kind of engaged with with the text at all which is fine um but i think there is a tendency when sex workers are raising problems that kind of pro-criminalization feminists find it hard to answer so when we're saying you know actually the criminalization of prostitution um you know means that we can be arrested for working together it means that you know police raids on our workplaces mean that migrant sex workers are more likely to be deported you know all this kind of stuff um obviously that doesn't really fit in with their politics because although they're pro-criminalization they also consider themselves to be feminists so they don't they you know claim not to want women in prostitution to be harmed as a result of the policies that they advocate for um but because they don't really have an answer to those problems because those things are really inextricable from the criminalization of prostitution you know if you criminalize prostitution uh you bring all the harms of the criminal legal system into the lives of prostitutes like that is that is full stop what happens um they don't really respond at all they like they kind of ignore those um those criticisms um or those problems that we're raising and instead the sex worker rights movement gets really caricatured as you know advocating for sex worker rights on the basis that we think sex work is amazing or that it's you know empowering or that we love it and we've chosen it which actually you know obviously in any broad diverse movement you can find people advocating almost anything um but but overall that is a a very um, kind of outrageous caricature of what the sex worker rights movement as a whole is saying, Um, you know, because what the sex worker rights movement as a whole is saying um, is things like the police are harming our communities. Uh, You know, we can't achieve economic justice or gender based justice through criminalization. Um, You know, policing and prisons and immigration can't keep us safe. Um, And those politics kind of, it's like they kind of just disappear under the waves um, and instead there's this there's this straw man of the prostitute talking about how much she loves her job and she gets she gets a lot of um, kind of press time um, and the kind of more 
complex, more real criticisms that sex workers make of capitalism and of policing and of white supremacy and of borders um, don't don't get much attention at all. You're right, stuck in the domain of sex and whether it is good or bad for women and adamant that it could only be one or the other. It was all too easy for feminists to think of the prostitute only in terms of what she represented to them. They claimed ownership of sex worker experiences in order to make sense of their own experiences. What do you mean by the claiming ownership of sex worker experiences in order to make sense of their own experiences? So I guess this comes back to um, a section you quoted earlier in terms of um, the idea of the, you know, the prostitute symbolizes um, the exploited position of the housewife. Um, you know, she she comes to symbolize the position of all women under patriarchy. Um, and again, like, as I, you know, that contradictorily, that doesn't produce uh, solidarity with prostitutes. It kind of produces the sense that our lives are available to be kind of plundered as metaphor um, by non-prostitute women. Um, and when we actually speak up about the material conditions that we face and the solutions that we need, um, we're seen as kind of almost like interrupting this conversation, which is paradoxically seen as having nothing to do with us, uh, you know, that's much more kind of highfalutin and about, about you know, um, you know, these kind of abstractions about uh, the harms that women experience on the patriarchy and the actual granular harms that sex workers experience as a result of the criminalization of prostitution um, can therefore be ignored or dismissed or swept under the rug or treated as a distraction. We have been speaking with Molly Smith. She is co-author with Juno Mack of Revolting Prostitutes, The Fight for Sex Worker Rights. You can find out more about an organization that she works with, SWARM, Sex Worker Advocacy and Resistance Movement, by going to swarmcollective.org. She also works with Scott Pep, a sex worker-led charity based in Edinburgh, which is working to decriminalize sex work in Scotland. You can find out more about that group by going to scott-pep.org.uk. And you can follow Molly on Twitter at pasta chips. One last question for you, Molly, and it's the same thing we do with all of our guests. We ask our final question, which is the question from hell, the question we hate to ask, you might hate to answer, or our audience is going to hate your response. And I really just don't know if this is going to fall in any of those categories. To what extent (laughs) does the way you view the police, either as protector or as punisher, inform feminist politics or any and all politics for that matter is the divide in our current debate between whether criminalization and policing is the best societal corrective or whether welfare is the appropriate solution is is the big debate should we feed the poor or imprison them yes i mean i think in terms of feminist politics that is a huge and very key dividing line um you know and and absolutely not just about sex work although obviously you know sex work is a key iteration of this divide you know are the police um protectors or punishers you know it comes up really strikingly uh even in abortion politics in the uk so um an anti-prostitution feminist uh mp um that i'm aware of uh recently wrote back to constituency a uh, constituent saying that she supported the continued criminalization of some forms of abortion in the UK um, precisely because she believed that that would protect women. Um, and of course, that's that's such a contradiction because the criminalization of those forms of abortion in the UK leads to some women being jailed for abortion. Like, that doesn't protect women. Um, <laughs> and, and it's just, like, it's absolutely fascinating how, um, you know, how much feminist energy goes into kind of attempting to further criminalize horrible things like street harassment, which is obviously, you know, horrendous um, and which no one supports, but which, um, and you know, and but which kind of draws so much energy away from um, other kinds of campaigns, you know, whether that's around like safe housing or around women's economic independence um, or even around kind of challenging police violence. Um, and I mean, I don't want to mischaracterize the feminist movement in the UK. There's like a really vibrant, thriving grassroots feminist movement that is really concerned with, you know, with economics and with police violence and with like safety in a much more broad, holistic, holistic term. 
Um, but absolutely, in terms of like kind of uh, governance feminism, perhaps there's this real emphasis on the on the idea that the police are the are kind of the people that can deliver feminist justice, um, and that's such a key dividing line uh, in terms of feminism. Molly, I really appreciate you being on our show this week. Molly Smith is co-author with Juno Mack of Revolting Prostitutes, The Fight for Sex Workers' Rights. And it's something that everybody should read because we so rarely get to hear the voice of sex workers, even when we're talking about sex work. Makes no freaking sense. Thank you so much, Molly. I really appreciate you being on the show. You've been listening to a This Is Hell interview. For more interview hell and to support the show, visit thisishell.com.